Washington Journal continues. Joining us from Boston is Michael Kirk. He's a documentary filmmaker and he's with PBS's Frontline's Bannon's War, a special which you can see tonight on PBS. Mr. Kirk, good morning. Good morning. A focus on Steve Bannon. Why is that? Well, when we were, we just finished making a film called Trump's Road to the White House in January. We talked to Kellyanne Conway and almost everybody else who'd been around the, the moment of uh, the president's election. And we wanted Bannon, and one of our producers uh, sent a text to him and said, we'd sure like you to come down and do some interviews. We were shooting in Trump Tower. And uh, Bannon wrote basically, no, you don't want me. All you guys do is want to, want to make me uh, Darth Vader. Well, that was enough for me to say uh, uh, there's got to be more to this guy than if you can be that sort of self-aware, there's more to this guy than meets the eye. I'd like to know everything I can about him. And I've spent the last few months going in beside, you know, in behind the sort of fireworks around the Trump administration, the chaos and disruption, which I always felt was a little bit of a dodge. It went down inside to the what, what, what we always go looking for, which is the Shakespearean struggle going on in and around the Oval Office, and that's where we reside in our broadcast tonight. When it comes to then Steve Bannon, what's the perception that you talk about, at least reference to him? What did you find out by, find out by looking at him specifically? Well, it's what one person told me, which is that Bannon is the message and Trump is the messenger. Uh, it's not quite as clear cut as that. Obviously, Trump has a well-known uh, perspective, but lots of people inside the film say Trump was spectacularly good at the gut instinct, and he'd been reading Breitbart, which was the website that Bannon was the uh, executive editor of, uh, ran the website in Washington out of a place called the Breitbart Embassy over by the Supreme Court. It it it, it was uh, Bannon who everybody says managed to take Trump's gut instincts and turn them into what was known as Bannonism, which is a sort of ideology that made it coherent what Trump was saying about America first, about the uh, uh, Muslims the, and the Muslim ban as they talked about it all the time, the Islamic terrorists, all of those kind of phrases and all of that is a sort of, has a sort of coherence that leads back to the immigration battles that happened on Capitol Hill in 2013 and 2014 in the post-2012 uh, election. So that's Bannon. Bannonism, the sort of uh, uh, coherent structure that you saw around Trump in those months from August to November when he won uh, the presidency. That's special Bannon's war you can see tonight on PBS. Michael Kirk joining us. If you want to ask him questions about the things he learned while uh, taking a look at Steve Bannon, 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8001 for Republicans and independents, 202-748-8002. Mr. Kirk, you referenced it, but a bit from your documentary tonight about how the executive chairman of Breitbart ended up meeting and coming into contact with Donald Trump. We'll show it to you. His influence was growing, and now Bannon renewed his search for a political warrior who could transform the country. Bannon, I feel like, has been someone who's been looking for a figurehead to attach himself to for a very long time. And in New York City, there was a Breitbart reader who was just the person Bannon was looking for. Trump was reading and digesting Breitbart news as long ago as 2013, 2014, uh, and, and internalizing these things. And nobody paid any attention because nobody cared about Donald Trump in politics in 2014. Bannon had been introduced to Trump by David Bossy, a producer on many Bannon films, and the head of the conservative advocacy group, Citizens United. Bossy and Bannon are friends, and Bossy says to Bannon, come on over and meet Donald Trump. Um, he's thinking of running for president. So they all meet up at the Trump Tower in New York, and they talk about it. I've known Steve Bannon for about 10 years, uh, worked with him on a lot of projects. Uh, he, one of the greatest strategic minds that I've ever been around. And Trump continues to keep a relationship going with Bannon from that point on. In Trump, Bannon had found a fighter who matched his own instincts. So Breitbart, Palin, uh, Trump, all are sort of anti-establishment figures, and I think that that appeals to Bannon. It was more about destroying enemies, and, and th that's where he and Trump, I think, really meet. I think they, they're very much into destroying enemies. 
Uh, Mr. Kirk, to that last point uh, about destroying enemies, talked about that and also talk about the fact that you uh, spoke with uh, someone formerly at Breitbart and also David Bossie as well in this uh, conversation or this documentary. Uh, uh, the, the, the thing that, that when Trump and uh, Bannon got together that first time and almost every time after that, it, it, that was the sort of common quality that they shared is a sort of real fighter instinct. You saw that manifest after the uh, firing of Jim Comey and the sort of pushback that was happening when Trump went to uh, the Coast Guard Academy last week and gave the commencement address and said, "Fight, fight, fight! I'm not going to keep my head down. I'm going to go. I'm going to go for it." Uh, that is pure Bannonism, uh, 100 uh, uh, percent. I think that's really the thing they have in common. Uh, Trump says that you know he recognized a kind of wealthy guy. Uh, who didn't, who was just kind of like him. I think there is an awful lot about the two of them that is very much the same, including that instinct to go after people, hit them when they're down, uh, winners and losers that Trump got from his father back when, uh, you know, he was a, a little boy. His father kept saying, there's a dichotomy in the world. There are winners and losers. And you, Donald, are a winner and have to be a winner. That's very much also inside the Steve Bannon backstory. So that's... Um, that's how the two of them uh, 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 really got to know each other and, and enjoy each other. And I think even to this day, with Bannon kind of under the wraps in some ways, uh, Bannon is there representing, uh, by my lights, the, uh, the base. Uh, a lot of the people we talk to, the Breitbart people and others, say that Bannon identified very early, first in Sarah Palin, and then uh, uh, through Breitbart and through the reader's comments at Breit from Breitbart, uh, who that base was that Trump was also identifying, a sort of nativist orientation, an America first idea that hadn't really been seen by the Republican establishment. And that sort of explains why Bannon at Breitbart went after the Republican establishment through the immigration uh, battle, adding on Jeff Sessions, Senator Sessions from Alabama, as a, as a collaborator with that. Stephen Miller, Sessions communications director. The three of them and the Breitbart staff really took down or, or participated seriously and importantly in the taking down of Eric Cantor and eventually, of course, the other members of the Republican establishment, including John Boehner. So they were kind of king killers in that sense. And that's what brought them to the attention of, uh, of Trump. And, uh, and, and that relationship is what brought Trump to the White House. Uh, Mr. Kirk, the term alt-right tends to be connected with Mr. Bannon, with Breitbart. What do you think about that term in light of what you've learned about both him and the entity of Breitbart News? We spent some time in the film tonight uh, wrestling with that question. Uh, a lot of people say you couldn't be uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, Breitbart without being a racist or an anti-Semite. Uh, we've talked to an awful lot of people about it. Here's the sort of consistent approach that, I mean, there are people who, of course, say you couldn't run that website, with, which has sections like black crime and illegal alien crime, and, and, and that engenders the kind of comments that you can read at Breitbart if you read them. Truly racist, anti-Semitic, uh, misogynist, uh, uh, xenophobic quotes. You couldn't run that if you weren't a racist and an anti-Semite. But uh, others we talked to said, wait a minute, uh, uh, the guy personally doesn't see himself and that they've never seen him or heard him say anything anti-Semitic or racist or xenophobic. But what they, uh, but what they say is uh, it is true that running that site uh, creates certain complications. Others say no matter who you are, if you're a prominent and he's one of the top three, you know, sort of really out there fringe uh, Republican conservatives, uh, you're going to naturally get pegged with uh, with those descriptions by the liberal left and by the and by the elite media. So in a way, it's a question that's not answered in our film. It's a question I I I leave to the viewer uh, and the American people uh, to decide based on the information that's available to them. Uh, Michael Kirk is our guest. Uh, you can see that special tonight on PBS Bannon's War, well, PBS's frontline program. Our first call for you, sir, is from Cal in New York, Democrats line. Cal, you're on with Michael Kirk. Go ahead. Hi, Cal. Good morning, Mr. Kirk. Uh, morning. I've just been a big fan of uh, your filmmaking on a PBS for years and years. Also, a special uh, shout out to uh, Will Lyman, who has also been a, uh, a narrator for PBS going back uh, decades. Uh, he's just always as reassuring a voice 
uh, in PBS as uh, you are, I uh, I wanted to uh, connect uh, your subject with uh, Al Green's uh, uh, discussion about uh, about uh, Trump the Trump administration and how all your films, even going back to your analysis of the Bush. Uh, administration and the Iraq war, you know, I as a viewer always uh, look forward to your uh, documentaries as some kind in uh, in terms of some kind of revelation, uh, some behind the scenes action of the administration. I guess uh, many viewers may see them, the journalism as a, uh, as a, uh, as a, uh, as a door to uh, damaging evidence that, you know, wouldn't necessarily lead to impeachment, but just a uh, a condemnation or a uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a a a relevation a, a so, condemnation. So, Cal, of the Cal, what are you looking for for our guests? Could you, as far as directing your statement or comment, what do you want to have him respond to? No, I just wondered uh, how his motives as a filmmaker coincide uh, with uh, the need of viewers to watch his films to get that kind of inside information that uh, may uh, uh, justify. Uh, their uh, negative views of the administration or any improprieties or illegalities they feel that they may be conducting. Gotcha. Well, so gotcha. Thank, thank you, Kel. Um, it's, you know, I think we probably made 11 films about the George W. Bush administration, the Iraq war, the torture issues, other things like that. We made eight films about the Obama administration, uh, equally, I, I think, uh, uh, touching raw nerves here and there. And here we are now making our second, really third film, we made a film called The Choice, which was the biography of, the woven biography of Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump back uh, in uh, last September. So this is the third film of what will probably be nine or, or 10 or 12 films over the next four to eight years, depending on how long the Trump administration lasts. Uh, we're, we're here for, uh, for serious long form journalism to, to take the high road, the sort of 30, thousand foot view, not uh, not above the fray of politics, but to get down in there and say, how do these dots all connect? You think you know a lot about what's been happening with Trump? Certainly it's been in the headlines every day last week of shocking revelations. Uh, we think the film tonight help, will help you understand some of the motivation and some of the Shakespearean war that's going on behind all of those headlines and all of those scoops. I'm not really in the scoop business, but I'm in the connecting scoops business so that you get to see a real trend. And I think that trend is establishing itself, Cal, uh, in a way that I hope our viewers over the years now, as they have with the Clinton first administration, then the Bush administration, then uh, the Obama administration witnessed a slightly different view than they get from the nightly news uh, from our films. Uh, from Pennsylvania, Democrats line. Fred, go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, Craig, I've always watched uh, your films, and uh, I'm a fan of Frontline. But could you give me some of your opinion of what have, might have been the feud between Bannon and um, Donald Trump's son-in-law, Kirchner? Would you have any idea? Yeah, I do have a, a pretty good uh, sense of that. They, they were, uh, during the campaign, real allies, because I think Jared uh, and Ivanka understood that Bannon was the guy who pulled it all together, rationalized Trump's policies, uh, kept him on the straight and narrow, kept him off Twitter in those last important 10 days when they were breaching Hillary Clinton's blue wall. I think uh, by the time they got to the White House, uh, uh, Bannon's philosophy has been chaos and disruption. And that worked very well to get Trump elected. Uh, they came promising they would break the administrative state. They would create chaos and disruption all over Washington. They would drain the swamp. And I think that when it seemed to be working, uh, Kushner was with him and Ivanka was with him for that time. But uh, Bannon is a little like a kamikaze or Che Guevara to Fidel Castro, those guys don't last very long once you assume the problems of governing. So everybody wondered, Bannon himself, how long Bannon could last with this theory of disruption and chaos. Uh, it, it lasted about a month. And what stopped him was uh, at least uh, made him go underground a little bit and come back. He's trying to come back now, was the idea that he went to CPAC, the conservative political action uh, uh, group's uh, annual meeting, and he stepped up 
and he drew the light to himself. He was then on the cover of Time magazine called The Great Manipulator. Saturday Night Live made skits about him being the real president of the United States. And it didn't take very long for Jared to draw the attention of the president, his father-in-law, to the idea that Bannon, who in the midst of all the other collapses that seemed to be happening around the travel ban and other things, that Steve Bannon was getting a little uh, big for his britches. And it, and it also didn't take long for Trump, who we all know is all about the spotlight is on me. We talk to people who say, you know, when it's failure, Trump is looking for somebody to blame. And when it's success, the Trump wants to be the one that receives all the credit there in the Oval Office. It is not a surprise that that happened. But when it happened for Bannon, Trump slapped him down pretty good. Uh, Mr. Kirk, we have a bit of that appearance that he did at CPAC back in February in which he talked about the media perceptions of Donald Trump and what they get wrong about it. We'll let you listen to what he had to say and get you to respond. They're corporatist, globalist media that are adamantly opposed, adamantly opposed to an economic nationalist agenda like Donald Trump has. President Trump really laid this out, as Ryan said, many years ago at CPAC. It's really CPAC that have, have really originally gave him the springboard. It's the first time at Breitbart we started seeing him and see, saw how people, re, you know, his speeches resonated with people. And then he would go out to these smaller uh, town halls later and really he got traction with the same message he's bringing today. Here's the only, re, here's why it's going to get worse. Because he's going to continue to press his agenda. And as economic conditions get better, as more jobs get better, they're going to continue to fight. If you think they're going to give you your country back without a fight, you are sadly mistaken. Every day, every day it is going to be a fight. And that is what I'm proudest of about Donald Trump. It, all the opportunities he had to waver off this. All the people have come to him and said, oh, you got to moderate. Every day in the Oval Office, he tells Reince and I, I committed this to the American people. I promised this when I ran, and I'm going to deliver on this. So, Mr. Kirk, there's uh, Mr. Bannon's defense of uh, the president. Any thoughts from that? Uh, yes. I mean, I think what you see there is the perfect example of, uh, of who Bannon is uh, to Donald Trump. Bannon is the base. Bannon represents the base. Uh, 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 Jared Kushner and Ivanka and, uh, and, and the Wall Street people that are around and the billionaires that are around uh, President Trump represent a more moderate uh, perspective, a, a more Wall Street, a more establishment perspective. Bannon continues to be the representative of the base, and his job, as he sees it, is to create the kind of chaos and disruption that the base elected Donald Trump to go in there and do to, to drain the swamp. That's the perfect articulation of the modus operandi and the, and the reason, I think, that Steve Bannon is still around Donald Trump, despite what looks like it at times, even especially now as he's touring the world, a, a sort of more moderate stance. The fact is, whenever the rubber meets the road, whenever the going gets tough, whenever the, the controversy starts to build, it seems like Donald Trump reverts back and remembers uh, what Steve Bannon tells him when he's in the Oval Office, which is fight, fight, fight. They're not going to give you your country. They're not going to give you this, the, this uh, government the way you want it to be, Mr. President, you're going to have to go get it and you're going to have to break a lot of China in order to do that. Bannon has in his office uh, whiteboards that uh, on which he has written the promises Trump made during the campaign and how they're doing on them. And I think the reminder of that over and over and over to the president of the United States is what Bannon sees his role, that's how he perceives what he's supposed to be doing. And his elbows are getting sharper and sharper in, uh, in those struggles inside of the many factions. There's also the Reince Priebus, uh, uh, Mike Pence faction inside there. It's all a swirling sea that Donald Trump likes to surround himself with. And I think Bannon right now is, is probably uh, laying a little low but he'll be back again with those elbows and that and that theory of fight, fight, fight. And that's exactly what you saw in that clip. Terry from Florida Independent Line. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Um, I just want to say that, um, you know, I had voted for Trump, but as soon as the transition team, and I think that was mostly uh, guided by Pence and Ryan, was uh, formed, that, you know, Bannon lost right there. Because this is truly a globalist agenda, nothing that Trump had ran on. 
And uh, it looks like, you know, if anybody wants to drain the swamp, why would you put the swamp monsters, the Godzillas, in charge? So with these competing factions, who's going to win? Who's going to lose? I can tell you the American people are going to lose. And I just want to apologize to everyone for my vote for Trump because it was certainly a mistake, and we need to rectify it. Um, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we've got to do this. If you just take a look, every little thing. I was watching Congress last week uh, propose uh, overturning overtime protections, time and a half for workers. There's a lot of vulnerable, gullible workers out there who will be taken advantage of. And it's little things like this. And uh, the big oil, it just, to me, it looks like big oil, the military, and the prison industrial complex. Gotcha, Carla, gotcha, Carla. We'll let our guests respond. Here, here's, the, here's the thing. Uh, every, I've been watching presidents since Jimmy Carter, and every administration has this fight. Uh, what, what most administrations have not had is the super fringe a group of people like uh, and, and, and someone like Steve Bannon inside the government. There are people who get you elected, but to stay inside the government and be vital inside the government in the West Wing is an extremely rare thing. Bannon brought with him three or four people. Jeff Sessions is the attorney general. They were all of a team once. And that's unusual in my view of uh, White Houses. There are people in that Oval Office who were the former radicals, the outsiders, the fringe people, who are now in the West Wing. It's interesting to watch and see how long they can last and how long they can withstand the forces that have come on every sitting president to get more to the center, to get more even to the, to the globalist uh, perspective that the world is operating under and has been for a number of years. It is Bannon's existence inside there that continues to sort of keep, from what I can tell, the base uh, satisfied that at least Trump is listening some of the time. And I think that's Bannon's one hope of, of winning, whatever winning is to him, uh, inside this particular administration, that he'll take a populist president and keep him uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that place that he was in when he was running and right after he was elected. He'll veer back and forth, but I think especially domestically, this is where Bannon says, look, I'm the base. I represent the base. You don't want to let me go. You don't want me let out of your sight because otherwise that side of it, that radical, revolutionary, uh, provocateur uh, uh, approach to government, the drain the swap mandate, will never be satisfied if I'm gone. And I think Trump uh, hears that. It's clear that he acts on it whenever he's in a bind. and and uh, And... And it's also true, from what we can tell from the poll numbers, certainly the Pew numbers and others, that a, a very high percentage of the Trump uh, true believers are still with him. And uh, I think an awful, lot, uh, an awful lot of that can be attributed to, uh, to Bannon's push and, and, and demand that, that the president fight. What will happen after this trip? What will happen when they get back here? What will happen when the uh, uh, independent counsel or wh whatever he's called now, the special counsels, uh, uh, begins to really investigate and, and that starts to hurt? Uh, how will the president respond? My guess is if Bannon is still around, the president will respond by fighting back uh, the way he did the week before he went off to the, uh, to the Middle East. Michael is in Alabama calling on our Republican line. Yeah, uh, I just want to talk about Bannon's influence. You saw that when, uh, you know, they tried to do the immigration thing with the Gang of Eight. And after that, they absolutely tore Marco Rubio down to, you know, nothing and just went after him so bad. And I just think that's what's wrong with the Republican Party is they're afraid of Bannon and Brett Bart coming after him, and it just drives me crazy that people listen and, you know, watch Brett Bart. I mean, you see all the headlines, it's like, man, that's crazy. Why would people even, you know, see that kind of stuff? But uh, it's I see his influence in the Freedom Caucus. I mean, if it keeps going like that, I mean, Republicans, I mean, they can just hang it up. Well, that was certainly uh, uh, Bannon's, Bannon's approach at Breitbart was just incredible how the, uh, the website changed from when, when Andrew Breitbart ran it. Of course, it was more Hollywood-centric. Uh, it was uh, 
Big Hollywood was uh, one of the blogs. When they consolidated all of it and brought it, uh, primarily the focus to Washington, the alliance with Jeff Sessions, the immigration battle that they picked as a way to get at the Republican establishment leadership, that was all a master plan that really did work. Uh, their numbers uh, of, uh, of uh, hits and people who use Breitbart as their primary uh, news source was a phenomenal growth over the three or four years, and it, and it is what uh, Donald Trump plugged into and got when he got Bannon Sessions and Steve Miller. Uh, it's been a real revolutionary change in that sense, I think, in terms of the way and around the Gang of Eight stuff on the, uh, on the immigration battle. That was uh, Breitbart and Bannon and Miller and Sessions really flexing their muscles. And, and when that happened, I think a lot of Republicans who didn't really know which way to go uh, decided they were not going to go out there and join the Democrats in a bipartisan immigration bill. And that said, that spoke volumes to Trump and it spoke volumes to Sessions, Miller and Bannon as well. And you see the result of it uh, now. Mr. Kirk, he's listed as a chief strategist, but you saw what happened the first time around when the Republicans introduced health care. You saw the travel ban meet legal challenges. Did that bruise Steve Bannon in a sense? I, I can't imagine that it did not. You also uh, didn't mention that Trump, after the uh, CPAC and all the headlines in the Saturday Night Live also removed uh, Bannon from the National Security Council, where he really didn't belong based on his credentials. He'd never been in the military. He'd never, you know, been in, uh, uh, had any uh, national security clearances or anything else. So it was a little odd that he was there, but he was removed uh, unceremoniously. And then, of course, uh, the president uh, uh, uttered those uh, words that, you know, Steve is a guy, he's a good guy, he works for me. Uh, to the Wall Street Journal and the New York uh, Daily News, it it you know it had to hurt, but uh, and I thought at the time we were finishing the film. I thought at the time, well, we now have the end of our film, which is that a kamikaze who comes to Washington, an insurgent who comes to Washington and works inside the government, lasts about a month. Uh, but by the hundredth day, we noticed that there was Steve Bannon again, flying on the helicopter, sitting next to the president going to Harrisburg the very night that the Washington Correspondents' Dinner, the White House Correspondents' Dinner was happening, that Trump had decided he wasn't going to attend. He's in Harrisburg at a Steve Bannon production, uh, an arena full of uh, the truly uh, true faithful and, uh, and a speech that's just like a campaign speech. It was, uh, it was Bannon back in play. Uh, uh, and Bannon's ideas alive. And during that week on the firing of Comey and the back and forth during all of that, even though Bannon uh, uh, reportedly was not in favor of letting Comey go at that time, there was Bannon, I assure you, uh, recommending that the president fight back, and, and he sure did. Uh, this is James in Apex, North Carolina, Independent Line. Oh, hello, thank you very much for taking my call. And I just uh, want to know your opinion. I'm kind of doing a comparison between Trump and Obama. Uh, and I understand that all leaders, you know, normally have some, you know, probably very strong-willed influence uh, by some individual. So uh, Trump seems to have the bannon of a of more of a conservative America first approach. Obama seemed to have, uh, you know, influence also from whomever, Jim Ayers, uh, Reverend Wright, more of a non-conservative and perhaps not America first. And I feel like I've got more faith in Obama in the direction he's heading. And then, of course, Bill Clinton had Hillary, and Hillary had uh, Anthony Weiner's wife. So they've all got it. But I'm kind of leaning more towards the influence of Trump in a conservative viewpoint than I had with Ob Obama and, and his background. So just want to get your opinion in comparison on the two. Uh, uh, I had the great good fortune of making, uh, uh, Frontline does a, a film every four years called The Choice, which is the woven, I mentioned it earlier, the woven biographies of the two presidential candidates, not with interviews with them, but by everybody who knows them. So it's sort of a comparison of who the, what the character of the people is. And along the way, when you make those films, you get to know all the people who've influenced, or many of the people who've influenced the various candidates. And I've been doing this all the way back before George W. Bush. The, here's the thing. Obama, Obama is very different than uh, Trump in this sense. He had many advisors around him, but Obama really sees himself as the brains of the outfit. Uh, he ran the State Department basically from the White House. Hillary 
uh, had the job but wasn't really doing uh, very much individual action. Uh, he ran uh, uh, most of the arguments that were had about what to do about Syria, draw a red line. There were so many things that Obama took that upon himself. He would listen to people, but he was really his own guy in an awful lot of ways. Uh, Trump is a different uh, uh, character in that sense. He has uh, always had someone close to him, a kind of consigliere type, and I don't mean that in the demeaning a way that it might be taken. He's always got somebody close to him. Uh, Roy Cohn was his uh, first attorney and his long-lasting compatriot in most of the battles when Trump was a, was a uh, builder and a developer. Uh, 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 Steve Bannon, in some ways, is the new manifestation of Roy Cohn uh, with ideology. He comes with a finely honed sense of the world a uh, civilizational struggle view that America is already uh, in uh, a kind of World War III with the Muslim world. Uh, and, and he feels it very strongly. His very first documentary, which we show tonight pieces from and talk about, a, a, a really, really a, a nod to Ronald Reagan, uh, Bannon's great hero at the time, uh, it's, it's, it's about that civilizational struggle that Reagan stepped up to uh, from his point of view. Communism, Nazism, you know, fascism uh, that Reagan stepped up to and, and prevailed. And I think Bannon believes that the attack of 9-11 was a manifestation of the next beginning of the next big war. And that he's been searching, he hoped it was Palin for a while, he's been searching for someone to be a political warrior for America, and I think Trump was a willing a recipient of that ideology and that understanding. He <clears throat> has influence much different than David Axelrod or Karl Rove or somebody like that uh, with the other presidents. This is, a, this is a special relationship, and it's come up against a family relationship, which is Jared and Ivanka. Gotcha. Got and that's fascinating. Mr. Kirk, I wish we can continue, but we have to end it here. Michael Kirk, the documentary filmmaker uh, beside, behind Bannon's War, which you can see on PBS's Frontline. Uh, find out more about Steve Bannon and his influence. Mr. Kirk, thanks for the time. You're more than welcome. Open phones until we finish our program today.